Hello, Marvelites. Welcome back to another episode of the MCU Exchange. We're here. We're back. There's a lot to talk about. Uh, as usual, Charles is with me. What's up? And it's me, Joe, your host. And we got some exciting stuff. We got news. We got trailers. We got episodes of Disney Plus and Black Widow finally released after what? Over a year of a wait. It has been a long time coming. So let's jump right into the news because we want to get to the fun stuff. Uh, let's start off. We got some She-Hulk news, some interesting things. Uh, first of all, a one of her enemies was potentially uh, revealed to be the Wrecking Crew. For those who don't know, the Wrecking Crew is a rather D-list uh, uh, kind of fighting group where pretty much what happens is one of the guys finds a magic enchanted well, I think t- iron, uh, like a uh, iron, and then it just transforms him and his friends into super powered people with wrecking names like Bulldozer. Yeah. It, it's a really weird group. Uh, I actually only know about them due to the Avengers uh, Earth's Mightiest Heroes animated series, but mm-hmm. it seems She Hulk will fight them um, in the upcoming Disney Plus series. Uh, are you excited for that? Oh, yeah. It's like, I, I, I'd even argue they're not. There are probably B list more than D list. Mm. Like, because they've been around since the 80s. And True. despite being around since the 80s, they have fought like a lot of heavy hitters, like, you know, Thor, the Avengers, Hawk, and everyone else. And they definitely have that sort of notoriety among older uh, comic book fans. So it is pretty fucking cool that they're getting, they're, 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 they're finally making their debut. It is yeah. also fitting that. Um, that She-Hulk gets to fight uh, the Wrecking Crew. What a way to sort of introduce this crazy, you know, this evil alliance of fucking, you know, construction-inspired villains by fighting a fucking Hulk. And <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they they st- they stick to the mystical origins of the yeah. of the team and not just make them, you know, if, if they end up like being like tech tech based or experimentations, I would be very disappointed. And I also hope that. They end up actually being construction workers, like blue collar workers, because in the comics, one of them is a scientist, one of them is like a straight up fucking ex con. Like none of them are actually yeah, it's workers. and it's so just I a weird hope, gimmick, right? Yeah, it's just like a wrestling gimmick, and I hope they they actually stick to being blue collar workers. No, I I agree. I think. I- that would be a way more interesting, especially with the whole aspect of She-Hulk being a lawyer and kind of looking at the world being affected by superheroes. I, yeah, I agree. They should not be like gamma powered characters. Um, they should really deep it. It's that, you know, it's the whole point of just this weird concept of, oh, they find a mystical item that turns them into this construction team of bad guys. <laughs> it's just like yeah. the concept is so out there, which is perfect for She-Hulk because we're all, we also got the news that they're, that she's going to break the fourth wall. Many Deadpool fans will be like, wait a minute, that's Deadpool stick. Well, technically it was She-Hulk stick long before Deadpool was even there. She was known for ripping up uh, covers for ripping open su- uh, panels to get from one point to the other. So this is pretty much in her wheelhouse. The question is, how do you think they'll handle it in the MCU, which is like this, ever-expanding universe with its grounded rules and you have a random character just kind of breaking every single one of them yeah and I, I, i'm excited because you know i feel like there's so much opportunity in in just bringing this like like i said it's such a classic sort of team where you got you, you got this team that is pretty much like bruisers and I feel like we don't get enough of bruisers, like big tank characters in in, in mm. the MCU. You got Abomination, and like that's pretty much it. Everyone just seems seems to be like you know like um like they're melee fighters, but they're also very like lean and mean, like like Bad Rocket model. I want to see like fucking characters that can actually punch the Hulk and make a dent. So that is very yeah. exciting. If they if they tackle that stuff, like you gotta make them like these are fucking tanks. And if you if you stay true to the fact that they are tanks, I think we're in for a treat. Definitely. And I hope they stick around. My biggest kind of gripe with a lot of things in, in Marvel Cinematic Universe is that they kill off villains way too early. <laughs> yeah. So we have underdeveloped villains that never even got a chance to shine because the films are hero-focused. And I think the Wrecking Crew would be like a fun, random group to show up and fight. 
And to be honest, they would fit right into a Taika Waititi film with Thor. <laughs> oh, yeah, they would, yeah. So, but it's exciting to see new, you know, creative here uh, villains show up. I wonder if we get um, the Absorbing Man. He, yeah, he's I, I, also seen with that group quite often in the comics. Yeah, and he has a, um, I guess, a wrecking ball, even though he's not Wrecker, he's not part of the Wrecking Crew, yeah. he has Wrecking Ball. Plus, he is also the husband of Titania. So there is so Ooh. much there is so much tie in here with 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 uh, absorbing man that I feel like they should do it. And I will say though, like even though I shit on Shield a lot, I feel like they got absorbing man correct as far as the look, yeah. the powers, how he uses the he even he even had the ball, the wrecking ball in the show. So that was pretty cool. But I want I definitely want to see absorbing man with the big leagues. Well, if they if they bring back the actor from Ages of Shield, we'll finally have the confirmation. <laughs> yeah, if he would show up, mm -hmm. if that shows canon or not. But it's going to be interesting, and I think She Hulk could be probably Marvel Studios' craziest shows. Uh, even though you know WandaVision already did that with their sitcom style, so it's going to be exciting to see how they things continue. Um, but we also have another interesting news about a returning villain. Corey Stahl, who famously played Yellow Jacket in the first Ant-Man film, is reportedly making a return in Ant-Man 3. Now, what is noticeable about the timing of this is that there was actually a Yellow Jacket uh, little cameo in the latest episode of Loki in the form mm -hmm. of a giant version of his helmet. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts, first of all, on Yellow Jacket, just from Ant-Man, and how do you think he might return, or are you excited to see him back? I, I fucking love Yellow Jacket, man. The, the character is not so great, but the costume is like incredible. Oh yeah. The design, the fact that we have a fucking villain who has who is generally colored yellow here, yellow and black, that is so distinct here in the MCU. It's the palette is amazing. E even though Corey Stoll didn't get a, he didn't get to do much at, apart from being like a mean executive. I feel mm. like there is some room there where. I feel like now that we're so far into the MCU, we can actually start doing the what Darren Cross looks like in the comics. If 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 you don't know, yeah. Darren Cross is like a pink Hulk in the comics. Does it make sense? <laughs> now I feel like he could do that and sort of build upon the the yellow jacket suit he created. And he's I, I personally love the actor. I liked him in House of Cards back when House of Cards was still good and not problematic. Mm. But Man, I'm glad that he's back, and I'm curious how he's gonna fit in. And certainly, that Loki cap, the, the Loki Easter egg, definitely raises some questions as to why Yellow Jacket has a giant head here. So who knows? I I had the same thing with the costume. It was actually when they added the costume to that mobile game Marvel Future Fight. It was the only reason I played it because I loved that costume so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. And. I personally, while I think the purple giant version would be hilarious, I kind of would love to see the yellow jacket that they kind of turned Darren Cross into like an anti uh, villain or anti hero in a sense. Mm -hmm. But he just lost his mind, so he keeps switching back and forth between good or evil. Because right. I, I really like Corey Stahl. He's a great actor. He was great, as you said, in House of Cards. He was very good in The Strain, uh, even though his hair piece toupee was yeah. really hilarious. Yeah. Uh, I think he would have a great career and a long term like Yellow Jacket. There's a lot to do with that character if they play their cards right. Just be a waste, you know, waste and villain again. Just have on appear for a short scene or not. Though, you know, with the title being Quantum Mania, well, there's a big chance he is in the Quantum Realm because we did see him kind of brutally shrink down. So it'll be interesting how they play on that fact. I hope they don't, you know, if he does show up as an actual character, I hope they don't kill him. Like yeah. you said earlier, like I feel like like Bad Shock. Bad Shock just fucking dies in. Does he die? Like does he die? He dies right in Falcon and the Winter yeah, Soldier. Yeah, he gets shot. Yeah. He dies. Like, fuck, that's fucking crazy. I mean, talk about bringing back a character only for for them to be killed. I mean, they did the same thing with Crossbones, where you know, sure he's back in Civil War with the costume, but he dies right away also. So I don't know. I hope they don't kill Darren Cross here. And that's the thing, like, Crossbones is a character, he's such a great recurring character in the comics, and the same was with, you know, but Truck the Leaper is not a huge character, but he's that perfect kind of, we need a villain who has character and we can throw in and everyone will recognize him, that was him. And he kind of, he died in a very dumb way, because this is the guy who yeah. moves around and kicks superheroes in the face, and he just gets randomly shot by Car uh, Carter. 
Yeah. Could have been handled better. Uh, you know, at the same time, they can always pull a twist and say, oh, it was her plan all along. I wouldn't be surprised if they pull something like that. But I really hope moving forward that they let villains live. We want to see more of them. We want to see them evolve. Please, Marvel, don't kill them. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true, yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of general the development of Marvel Studios, we have heard so we have the big what if trailer drop before we get to that um there was a, a post on linkedin by one of the marvel studios animation executives who pretty much confirmed that what if is one of many uh animated shows coming uh to probably disney plus this is an interesting surprise uh we thought like animation would continue for the usual kids fair but it seems to imply that we're getting more shows like what if are you excited to see Marvel Studios venture more into animation? And, like, what are your hopes to see get an animated adaptation? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm very much excited. I mean, I, I, I've seen some people, like, real hardcore animation fans sort of, you know, sort of be underwhelmed with, with the animation style of What If. Um, mm. I guess for me, maybe I'm just ignoring me. I don't, I don't watch a lot of animated stuff. And so when I see stuff like that, that, that is very different and unique for me i kind of lose my shit over it and that's pretty cool but i am very excited that marvel studios is, is dabbling in more canon hopefully canon um animated stuff because there is just so much room to do here like you can practically make any show about anything and make it canon you can explore the cosmic side of things without worrying about you know expensive budget expensive actors here you could you could do that. You can even do like smaller stuff that otherwise wouldn't get made in live action, but make it canon in the MCU. There's just so much you can do, and it's promising that that they still have plans to to make more stuff beyond what if. It's it's exciting that they're you know adding to the venture. Though the question is, it's like what kind of story will we have? You know, are they doing the Star Wars animation to live action and back kind of thing? Especially with, you know, what if, you know, there's obviously actors missing, uh, most notably Robert Downey Jr.'s voice not being in the trailer. It, it's yeah. going to be interesting how they find that balance. I, I personally think that animation is great, but they shouldn't overdo it. And I really hope that they do tackle new animation styles. I like what if. I think it serves its purpose. It's a very unique visual design. But if it's always the same design, that would be an absolute waste of the medium, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, speaking of Robert Downey not being in what if, I feel like we can talk about the what if trailer now. It yes. is, it's pretty fucking weird. Like, that's the first thing they show <laughs> in the trailer. Like, it's at first it's cool, like, oh my God, they're recreating Iron Man 1, the opening scene. And then the dude speaks, it's kind of like, Wait, who are you? Like, <laughs> that's not Downey. And then we learn that uh, we're not getting Evans too, we're not getting Bree, we're not getting Cumberbatch, and I think. I feel like we're not getting someone else, but I forgot who. But it seems like all the expensive cast members won't return. But you know, going back to the to the um, uh, other animation stuff, I I would I don't know how I'd feel if they brought Cap back. Let's say they made a Captain America series on mm. about him returning the stones and hanging out with the TVA. I feel like it would be weird if it's not Evans. Even yeah. though, even though we know, we, you know, it, it doesn't have to have Chris Evans's face on it. Something about it not being him just makes it less special. I mean, no, no offense to any of the the talent they got, whoever they got to replace Robert Downey, it's a job they have to do it. But it does make it feel less special here. And I don't. Know, I feel like watching What If it's going to be a hurdle to get over. But at least we do get to hear. Chadwick one one last time as T'Challa. I feel like that is going to be a very yeah, yeah. bittersweet episode j just because his voice is there. He changed his voice a lot though in this because I at first wasn't even sure if it was really him. Yeah, it, it is a bit. Um, it's less bassy. I don't yeah. know what, 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 how 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 to describe it, but it is. It even sounds a bit higher pitched here, and I mean if you think about. His 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 fight with cancer, he could be he could have very well recorded the, his his yeah. his lines at the peak of his fight, right? So that could be, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we don't know, but I'm glad that you know they they, they managed to get one more performance out of him before he passed. 
Definitely. It's just, it's all of this is so strange because you have like, there's a long list of actors returning. I think even Michael B. Jordan is returning as the voice Killmonger. Yeah. But why are like the big names missing? Why is Chris Evans not there? Why is Robert Downey Jr. not there? Of course, people added, you know, theories. Oh, Robert Downey Jr., you know, he did, he's not following anyone from Marvel anymore on social media, which I think that guy just, he's business. He does social media, yeah. what he needs to do. Yeah. But it's, it does feel like they said, okay, we don't have the money to pay them to do the voices because there are a lot of characters in this. But it just makes it opens up the question. It's like, okay, then what's the focus? What's the point that you're trying to get? What if looks like a lot of fun, but why are we making those sacrifices? Why not build around that? You know, find the vo who's open to the voices and do the story surrounding that kind of thing. Because now we have, you know, Peggy Carter's real, but Chris Evans isn't. Yeah. It's really confusing. Hey, Though go I, I have, to, yeah, go, go ahead, ahead, go ahead. I I think in in general the trailer looks very promising and it does look very good. They did get a long list of you know, MCU actors. I yeah. I do get the feeling they're focusing on very specific versions of the characters though. Yeah, but like those are the ones they definitely wanted the main voices. I mean, so like like for me, like we we found out like yesterday that holy shit, Ultron is finally got vision's body in the show no and in the trailer there's a shot where vision is talking but it's not james spader it's not and or rather it's it's vision talking but it's not paul bettany and i was like thrown yeah. off like that and we find out you find out that oh shit that's because it's ultron but then again it's not james spader and that to me is kind of like oh man you're not bringing james spader in this what you're giving him ultron you're giving the show ultron like what's ultron going to sound like i feel like Jamie Spader is kind of like, at least his voice here in Age of Ultron is almost kind of like James Earl Jones, where yeah, it's so fucking deep. It's so, it's so weighty and scary. And I don't know if you can find someone else to just replicate that voice. I'm sure there is, but I wonder how accurate it would be. I feel like more than Downey, more than Chris Evans, Ultron's voice is fucking... That's signature, and yeah, I'm worried that he's not in the cast. But the idea that Ultron is back and he he finally has an adamantium body and he has that Ultron armor and he has the fucking stones, I feel like the Black Widow post post apocalyptic episode is gonna be fucking insane. Oh yeah, I I can't wait to see this. I hope maybe there's still a chance that James Spader's in it. They just haven't revealed it yet or something. It, it's tough. Like I agree, uh, Ultron. Also one of those villains that I wish was sticking around and showed up more because I want more James Spader as the character. I love the development and the, the direction they went with him, but like not bringing him back. It, it's weird. It makes you question. So what is the point of what if if, you know, yeah. if they if it especially because they're kind of implying it's canon in the multiverse because that's the big tagline. So yeah. it's like, OK, but why do we bring back, em, em, you know, why do we bring back an actor to play a CGI character like with uh, Emil Blonsky? Uh, I forgot the, the actor's name. But we do that, but we don't bring them back for an animated series. So are are we facing actors right. that say that's beneath them? Do they just not want to do it? But, you know. I think it's ultimately a contractual thing. Especially it being animated, I guess there is less incentive to spend money on these actors because their faces are not even going to be on it. Like, they can't even no. mark the show with their face. Um, I guess it's just that. I imagine for Evans and Downey, they probably weren't able to secure a clause that said, hey, we can use you for this animated show when their stuff ended in Endgame. Mm. Uh, because if you, if, you look about, if you look at it, like, who who's in the... Who's in What If? Who's the big actor? Mark Ruffalo and Chris Hemsworth. They clearly got their contracts renewed when for Thor 4 and She-Hulk and whatnot. But for Evans and Downey, I feel like it ended as soon as Endgame ended. So there was uh, an incentive to renegotiate with them just for a fucking show you can even use their face in. So it is definitely super practical, but yeah, it is, it is, it is, it does make me wonder, like, why... Like you said, why, why, why did you pay Tim Roth to show up in She-Hulk but not pay him to voice, you know, in What If? It is, it is crazy, but the show looks good. I mean, I feel yeah. like, for me, like, Killmonger feels like 
Killmonger surprisingly is like on the forefront on, of of the show. Like he's like he has a lot of scenes there. No. It seems like he is gonna be the Black Panther in this Guardians of the Multiverse because if you see the 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 re- recreation of the Avengers 360 shot, it's T'Challa, Star Lord. It is Thor, Party Thor. It's Gamora, and then it's there's a Black Panther behind them. Yeah, so that, I think that, that was sorry. Probably, I think that's Killmonger at this point. Yeah, it was it was leaked with the Funko Pops because there's a Funko Pop with uh, called King Killmonger. Oh, there you with go. With him yeah. in a Black Panther suit. Yeah, there Which, you go. Kind of interesting, considering the fact that a lot of people are campaigning for him to be revived for Black Panther Two. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, you know, he becomes Black Panther in this what if scenario. I, it, it looks really interesting. I'm really curious how it all, all ties together. Um, the thing is, you know, even with the voices, they can easily pass it off as saying, "Oh, these are variants that look the same but have different voices." I think the characters where they put a lot of emphasis on the original voice actors returning might have a bigger live action role moving forward. I guess I could that see is... that. Because that's see... what you want them to be, you know? Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. But it is cool that, you know, we, we, we thought that this was an anthology, but it kind of looks like they're sort of skewing that anthology concept a little bit because they yep. can actually make this anthology canon. And that's, that's that's exciting to me. I, I can't wait to see how it comes together. I mean, Peggy Carter looks like she's fighting Shuma Garath. I'm assuming that's Shuma yeah. Garath, but I feel like it also could be like a literal, a literal Hydra monster. She is fighting Hydra after all there, so it's exciting. It could, also, it could even be Doctor Strange, who has like tentacle fingers. Right. It's very exciting to see how this could all pan, pan out. I do think that What If is kind of a spin-off out of Loki and will spin into Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness, which is an exciting prospect because it is kind of this next-level animation to live-action transition that we're seeing. And the the weird thing is, is that, like, even if we're saying, hey, this is weird that the actors, the voices are different, Star Wars has kind of done that already. They've had it with Ahsoka being a completely different voice actor and live-action actor from their translation. So this might be a way to move forward, to have animation still work, to do the stories they can't. I mean, they literally had, what was that? I think that was Ant-Man's head in a jar. <laughs> it was randomly. voiced by Paul <laughs> Rudd too. Paul Rudd is back to voice his own head. Which is, he's not a small time actor also. So it's it's like, there's a lot of stuff happening in this series, which I think makes it probably perfect for animation at the same time, a perfect kind of, exploration i'm really curious to see what the watcher his role is in this besides the narrator they're implying kind of that he also helps out these guardians of the multiverse um Mm -hmm. i do love the the connection between it and eternals where both say we will not intervene and they're obviously going to intervene Mm -hmm. (laughs) these deities man they think they're Mm -hmm. almighty but they still help out (laughs) Mm -hmm. very true and Let's see what surprises are heading our way. You know, we've seen a lot of like kind of nice surprise appearances or characters. Who knows what else is, you know, hasn't been revealed yet for that series. And especially with animation, they can throw in anything they want at this point. Yeah, I agree. Uh, You know, I think it's time. Let's talk about the Loki episode. It's time for the exchange. Uh, We had the big fifth episode this week. We finally uh, followed up on what happened to Loki after getting pruned. He met three versions of himself. Uh, boist- I think boisterous Loki, kid Loki, and classic, especially classic Loki standing out, played by the Richard E. Grant. Uh, and we followed up on this story to kind of find out more about them, about this weird world. We got a appearance of a life. Like, that is a deep, deep cut in comic mythology. Um, you know, if Wrecking Crew is nothing compared to the finding out a life is in the MCU. Um, but also, they have the Thanos copter in the background. Before yeah. we get into the story details, how did you love the Easter eggs in this episode? Which oh, one the, was your favorite? Um, Probably Throg. Oh, uh, like yeah. It's just like, as someone who grew up reading the... Walt Simonson comics because my dad had a bunch of them. He's a huge Walt Simonson fan. It is surreal that Frog is somewhat canon here, even though it's like the void and whatnot. It is crazy that they actually showed a bit of Frog. You know, he it's not a full fucking scene, but 
it is a crazy Easter egg, so it's definitely my favorite. But this episode alone is just so was just so generous in giving us so much shit, and I feel like it's it's so crazy because for episode three, I was complaining that oh blah blah blah, this happened. There's not much going on here, but here it's kind of like that. Not much is going on here. They just hang out the entire time, but their entire hangout is just so fun and nerdy that I feel like. <laughs> You know, I feel like I'm I'm being biased here, but it's just so enjoyable for me as a comic book fan to have an episode as generous with Easter eggs as this one is. Yeah, it was yeah. really generous. I I like the the comic Easter eggs were amazing. I, as a big fan of urban myths, love the amount of cameos of these different. We saw the Great Tower of Alexander. We had freaking USS Elber Eldridge. Hell, they even had a Polybius system in the background that was teased by by po by you know by the early trailers. Like, there's a culmination here of comic references, MCU references, like we mentioned, Yellow Jacket, the freaking Living Tribunal makes an appearance finally in the MCU yeah. as a broken statue. There's so much here, um, and the interesting thing is, uh, there's a lot of references or connections to comic origins to the Kang the Conqueror, because we even have the, what we thought was Stark Tower, turns out to be the Kang Tower. Yeah, the the, the fact that, we, that there is the Kang Enterprises building here, I feel like that is the, that's the most concrete Easter egg of where the show is going. No. Yeah, it's, it's, it, go ahead. It's interesting if you consider that a lot of people looked into every like comic reference for WandaVision saying it is it, it is Mephisto, even though like the connections were very, very loose at the time. And here we kind of have the most obvious comic references to the character. Even Elioth himself is a Kang reference. So it just right. seems more and more likely that it is him at the the tower and the, the man in the high castle. Yeah, the castle looks fucking intriguing. Like when you if you we always talk about the shots in the trailer in the previous episodes. I feel like the castle is going to look amazing as well. Right? Yep. It, it, sure. uh, the visual design of it, what yeah. we saw in the trailers, like it's this built castle, but it has like these rips and broken pieces in it, keeping mm -hmm. it together. Yeah, it looks pretty cool, but I feel like, I feel like the entire show, let, let, let's say they nail the finale, and it's great, Kang is great, the castle is great. I feel like still the MVP of the show, or the, the MVP moment of the entire series might be classic Loki, yes, doing that best send off ever in the entire MCU. It looks so fucking bad. It's so heroic. It's so bad. As it's so uplifting. And props to Richard E. Grant for getting to do that scene. Concerning how much screen time he has, uh, they really developed this character because the thing is, is that he is pretty much the result of everyone's fan theory. What if Loki, you know, survived Infinity War? Which is kind of hilarious to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they do such a such a great job of having this character development of, and I think this is kind of like the big reveal of the episode because we all in the beginning thought that the reason the Nexus points are created are because, you know, the Loki isn't Tom Hiddleston like with Sylvie that she was a girl, uh, but it it turns out it's kind of like if the character turns good, is kind of the true Nexus point if the character tries to ch change away from their binding it's yeah it's interesting it, it's really interesting and with with classic loki we get that development in such a creative way because it is you know a tribute to the the same version of loki from i think agent of asgard because the way he goes out is is pretty similar with the laughing the monaigle but this time they put it in a rather sad context to add some incredible character development to loki yeah I mean, hell, he missed he missed his brother in Asgard, and just and to help himself, he created the home he was missing. Yeah, I mean, I tweeted about it. It's such a uplifting scene to see. You got Loki, a Loki, conjuring up his home, his home that he killed people for, he betrayed his loved ones for, and he basically Loki's based their life on Asgard, their their dreams of ruling Asgard one day. And the fact that even before death, 
it's still Asgard in his mind. But it's not like mm-hmm. Asgard. I want to rule Asgard. But it's like, here's my home. It's fucking beautiful. Without yeah, my really. bullshit, with my bullshit, it's fucking beautiful. And I'm gonna. Here's how I'm gonna distract this gas monster. And it's such a powerful just statement to make. And I like that the they they managed to even think about that in this show. Yep. Really, really great episode. Yeah. A lot on classic. I wish we got a little more out of Boisterous Loki. I like this character. I think there was a lot more of potential with him. Kid uh, Loki seems to be kind of kept open though. Yeah, there's definitely room for to do stuff with Kid Loki. I mean he just kind of walks away. I kind of wish he also helped around with mm. with the with the fight against Igilioth. But who knows where he went. I will say though, it is sort of hilarious to see that President Loki, whatever he is, the boat Loki guy. It is weird that we thought that that's what <laughs> Wilson would end up being here. It's weird yeah. that that's a variant, and they actually showed us a variant from the trailers alone, like an off, like a true a true variant in the trailers alone. Now it it feels kind of weird to use that image in any of our in our articles now because knowing that's not <laughs> really real Loki, right? Yeah, definitely. Because the the video is like, wait, the image technically doesn't work. It's not the same character. Yeah, it I'm is. really glad though that they did add a variant that just looks exactly like him. You because know, that's I, been kind of something they've been dodging a little. I was. I, 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 why did you mention that? I wish that. They changed his look up a bit for the show. Maybe like he had a scar in his eye, like some different shit just to make him look different. Um, I know that he looked like Tom Middleton in the trailer as a misdirect. But I feel like for for the episode, they could have like, I don't know, give him longer hair or maybe give him a nose ring or some shit just to make him different. <laughs> but it's a nitpick. I mean, it's a great episode. And I think another favorite part for me is like the, Mo- the Mobius and Loki goodbye. Yeah, it made me. It, it it was definitely like Sam and Frodo saying goodbye for one last time, and it kind of feels like yeah, they won't see each other after this episode because it's such a amazing sweet goodbye here. And I don't know, it's like how would you feel if you see Loki and Mobius reunite in the end after this heartfelt goodbye? Like, what do you think of that? I think it depends strongly on the situation i've seen some people proclaim that mobius turns out to be the one above all like the final tva agent who created the timekeepers oh god which would be a strange thing to be like oh goodbye and and walk into the castle and like oh hey mobius (laughs) it's you yeah there's no no fucking way it it, it's you know i think that i do think they're gonna see each other again sadly because they kind of have to wrap stuff up and we have seen some footage from the trailers that may hint at how the story continues after the big revelation. But uh, I do think they're going to see each other. It won't be as emotionally impactful. I think it depends on what is the emotion at the core of when they meet each other. Is it him running around, uh, running away? Is it him being saved again? Because that's, that's kind of the one problem I think I had with the show is that with a concept like the TVA, they kind of get away from things a little too easy because you just open a portal, walk through, and you're back. Yes, it, it, it's tough, uh, but I, I do kind of think they will see each other again, though. I don't think that was the last goodbye, but it was certainly a great emotional moment. And God, what a powerhouse Owen Wilson is in the show. I feel like, let's say that is their last goodbye as Mobius and Loki. I feel like in the end, there is some sort of idea going around that everything's going to reset to where they came from. Where where the, mm. the show ends with Loki 2012 at, at Avengers Tower, that's where you get the scene where he's talking to himself in the mirror in the trailer. Mm. I, I feel like that's where the show could end, where everyone, including the TV, all the variants will return in the respective timelines separate from the sacred timeline. I feel like Mobius is going to go back to the 90s where he was selling jet skis. And I'm, I'm I'm partially hoping for a scene where Loki, remembering every single thing he went through, meets mm. Mobius, who doesn't who does not remember a single thing. And they have this sort of moment where Mobius is like, "Oh hey, do I know you? Have you met?" And Loki's kind of like, "Now we haven't," even though 
Loki knows they've met at some life, at some point in life. I feel like that's gonna be a good I guess, a, if they meet, that's how I want them to meet. Mm. I have one question for you. Do you think the TVA will be gone after this season end? Uh, she, a series ends? Oof. There is season two. Mm. Clearly, Owen Wilson is the runaway star here. Definitely, it'd be, yeah. It'd be crazy economically and financially marketing-wise not to even have Owen Wilson in season two. But for story-wise, I feel like the TVA should end. Mm-hmm. Especially, in, it's fake. It's not... It, 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 the, the shit they're fighting for is kind of pointless. So, I, I mean, I, I have no idea how the TVA is gonna last from a story perspective, but I do want Owen Wilson to be part of the MCU still moving forward. So, I Definitely don't know. Am. It's a hard... It's a tall order to figure that out. I think the way to do it, because a lot of the parallels of the TVA is also, you know, the the curse of the 9 to 5 is kind of creating this parallel of the employees taking over, setting a new path for the TVA, kind of instead of deleting and, and taking away, judging variants by helping them find their path or making sure. The problem is, you know, how far can they intervene before it becomes a multiversal conundrum? I still like part of me wished that the the whole multiverse uh, what if series just kind of with each episode you saw the TVA just move in or become more and more obvious. And that was just yeah. a running gag through the series. But, you know, we know that's not going to happen. It's going to be interesting. Uh, and the big question is, you know, is this going to end in a multiversal war? Where are we heading with this story? And I'm I'm really curious to see what the future holds for this. But it, it's an exciting one. And only four, three more days to go until we find out who's the man in the castle. Pretty exciting. I cannot wait. I cannot, want to, I cannot wait to see Jonathan Majors finally make his debut. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't, I doubt we'll see him in, you know, the Kang costume if he shows up. I think we're getting a very different ver- version of him in this because we do know that the comics had the Immortus version part as the time variance. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to be interesting how we get to see him. And it's a lot of fun. I think the speculation was still a lot of fun. And you see a lot of people still saying, oh, it's King, it's a King Loki version. It's this version. Can't wait to find out what's going to happen. Yeah. But we had to wait. You know, the wait is already long enough to go see the next Loki episode to finally find out what happens after six weeks. The wait has been a bit longer for Black Widow. Two, I think two years and about two months we, uh, a year and two months has was the delay. We haven't had a Marvel film in over two years by now. The last one being uh, July's release of Spider-Man Far From Home. It's been a long wait. Uh, but Black Widow is finally here. Uh, and what were your, your what are your initial thoughts on the film in, in like in general? Did, did you come out excited? Do you are you looking forward to what was like your favorite character? Or what do you, what was your favorite moment? Um, it is, it's okay. <laughs> it's not, <laughs> it's no fucking Winter Soldier. It's, it's no Civil War. It's no, you know, it's no Iron Man 1. It's a fine solo movie as far as solo movies go. Um, it does give justice to the way, or rather, it does, it, it, it does give a proper send off for Natasha's legacy. Just from the post credits alone, they actually gave her some sort of funeral at the end. It, it's an okay action movie. The cast is incredible. I feel like mm-hmm. that is a saving grace of the movie. Florence Pugh is clearly a DC scene st- stealer here. Maybe David Harbour second, and then Rachel Vice third. But yeah, the ensemble is good. The cast is good. The first action of the two thirds of the movie is incredible. But yeah, the last act and the villains there kind of make kind of you know it, it makes this movie feel a, a less special mm. the stuff they drop and uh, like taskmaster is disappointing drake is like fucking it's fucking garbage and yeah i, I think all in all it, it results in a very okay movie it's not mm. you know it's not it's certainly not bad i feel like it's not it's far from being one of the worst mcu movies it's like middling it, it, it's it's mid high for me. That's yeah. how I describe it. it. It's a mid high movie, maybe in the top twenty, 
maybe the top 12 MCU films, maybe the top 15 M- MCU films, but yeah, it's definitely not Incredible Hulk, not Iron Man 2 level bad. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's how I, I feel. I, I think the film, you know, it's it's a troubling thing. It's the film that comes after Black Widow kind of has been waiting for a film for way too long. It has the trouble of being a midquel between Infinity War and Civil War, which are just very bombastic big films. And it tries to tell this very intimate story, but falls into some, like especially the third act, I think falls into some Marvel territory where instead of keeping it simple, they kind of had to make it overly ambitious, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because the whole point of the Red Room, I actually like the reveal of the Red Room just being this random sky station out of nowhere oh my god the problem the fucking it's it's a fucking bond layer it's incredible it's it's like straight up from the comics it's it's so comic booky and and it makes me just wish there were more bond stuff here because it it is a bond layer yeah And, and and it works perfectly and i think like drakoff i don't think he's a bad villain he's just we don't see anything of it like this is the big problem with also taskmaster they don't have a big role in the film. The focus is on Natasha, uh, on her role with her sister, with the family. And like the villains take, this is very phase one like mistakes where the villain takes a huge backseat to the main characters and to the, to their like emotional arc. So the buildup to their big evil villainy just is kind of, Oh, it's there, but it wasn't like set up as well. My problem with Drake is that, like sure, he 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 probably is the most evil MCU villain we have. Like he like he's a fucking human trafficker. Like fuck you. There is no there is no backstory that would make me go, oh, I see why you're doing that. No, fuck you. You can go to hell. But the problem for me is that the way Ray Winston plays him is like I mean, I wrote it in my review. He plays it like a grandpa who can't get his Viagra to work. <laughs> it's just not compelling to watch to see him grumble and be sh- scream at scarlet i feel like like i said this movie has so much bond references i mean olga Kurlyenko is there she's the bond girl rachel mm-hmm. vice she's fucking married to james bond she's J- daniel craig's wife um scarlet johansson watches a bond movie here mm-hmm. i feel like they should have just, i feel like they, just, just, they should have just embraced every bond thing here and make give us a bond villain Give us a, a cheesy, broad, entertaining Bond villain. Because if you think about it, even Hela in Ragnarok, she's not a good villain. But the the fact that Kate Blanchett plays her so cheesy, yeah. so hammy, so over the top, almost like a drag queen, it works. It's fun. It, it's, it's entertaining. I feel like you could also do that here with Dreykov, who's super evil. You can have totally evil characters that are engaging to watch. You do not have to make them sympathetic, but you have to make them, you know, worthwhile to watch. Like, um, I wrote in my review, like, um, No Country for Old Men. Javier Bardem is, like, the devil in that movie. But he's so menacing. He is so distinctly unique in his role no. where he's just, just a silent dude carrying a nail gun the entire movie. But he's terrifying. He's so engaging to watch. I feel like you could do something with... With Rakov, you, you could have made him maybe like someone like Blofeld, you know, just totally over the top. You know, if you look at the the, the next Bond movie, Rami Malek, he, it kind of seems like he is playing a total, you know, it's a character with, yeah. with, a, like, with, a, with, a, with a burnt face, with a cre- creepy mask. And he is very over the top, flamboyant and very broad. I feel like that's that's the route they should have gone with Rakov here. I I agree that they should have embraced the bond because the film feels like a mixture between Mission Impossible and Bond. That kind of feels like where they were going with it, uh, especially in the action. I mean, let's be honest, the action is probably the most visceral stuff we've seen for the franchise and very well shot. Like you see a lot of stuff that's happening. But the thing with Drakov where I have a little trouble saying, OK, he should have been like over the top is that. Like, does him being an over-the-top, cheesy villain undermine the really serious and dark theme of the story? Yeah. Because 
that's kind of the the problem that they they create is that when I think that's why he is the character that he is because if you kind of mock the man who's stealing young children, young girls from families from the streets and turning them into mind controlled puppets uh, to do his bidding, it's really tough to kind of go goofy, haha, you know that kind of villain without it becoming or diluting the message you're making. I mean, you don't need to make it haha and shit. You just gotta make the character distinct enough where yeah he has a personality like it, it's bad enough that like i don't even know what the fuck break of wants with the red room like he has a red room he has a an army of spies that can dismantle countries that, that can dismantle the world but okay who cares like is that your <laughs> plan like it's not a plan it's just like it's like a fucking business it's not a yeah there's no plan there's no like what's he up to here like I have no idea. He just has a really shitty evil business and that's it. There is no game plan. There is no like at least we talked about Yellow Jack and Darren Cross. At least Darren Cross had the plan to ship and you know mass sell produce. Them. Yeah, he had the, the plan to sell the yellow jackets, which would mean total chaos in the world. But here there is no plan. It kind of seems like you know, Dracov just has this this business looming over everyone's heads like it's it's great it's it's so odd that there is no end game here it yeah it's a little weird choice to have them not have a goal that that's the problem like i said they, they don't give him enough time they're they're pretty much Drakoff uh in general his entire existence is only there because he was mentioned in avengers that was the big Loki speech uh, when Black Widow was tricking into finding out what he was doing. He mentions Drakoff's daughter. And that kind of feels like they took that concept and built the film around it ra- and, and kind of binded them. Because at the end of the day, it didn't even have to be Drakoff. Why did it have to be the same guy she already took down? Why wasn't it someone continuing right. the legacy would have made the twist even more darker? Because one evil goes away, another takes its place. And I kind of, like, this sounds bad because it's a very heavy subject, but I kind of want to see that kind of trend continue because I think the Red Room, there's an importance to it of how evil exists. Like, there is no, in the real world, you take care of the bad guy and it just ends. And and that was, like, my big problem with Black Widow. I really enjoy the film. I think, for me, it's, like, a a good, decent 8 out of 10. But everyone got away way too easily at the end. Everyone survived. There, there was like no consequence for the what they've done. But not yeah. even you know, not even Natasha getting arrested because we don't know what happens between when they show up to pick her up and then where she's just running oh. around free. <laughs> Dude, that ending is so fucking bizarre. It's it's like it's weird. It's it's so fucking weird. Weird. Like I feel like they just wanted to end with a cool shot. Like it is a fucking cool you know shot for for the movie to end on. But it's like what? That's your ending? It's like you could have rode off into the sunset with your family. Like It just doesn't quite line up for a good ending. And it's just, I don't know. I have no idea why they decided to end like that. If if I, like, this is, this is like, you know, I'm not rewriting. I, I, you know, I'm not in the writer's room. But, like, I personally think what would have made this film stronger was that the twist was, in fact, Taskmaster, who we can talk, you know, who's the spell. She's, she's the daughter that she thought she killed turn into this like this mindless drone like what if taskmaster was in reality the one controlling the red room continuing the legacy of her father surviving yeah, thing and turned herself into the taskmaster to defeat you know that not even her own things could uh, her own drones could defeat her and stuff like that that i think would have been a way more powerful with drake yeah Huff just literally being a puppet that everyone thinks he's still alive yeah because that is... the thing is is that I'm sorry yeah, go ahead go ahead because the thing is, is that Natasha gets away kind of scot-free with the fact that she killed, she, let, let's be honest, she manipulated a little girl, but having a bomb with her, thought she killed this innocent little girl, and it turns out she survived and all is good because her dad was an asshole. <laughs> yeah. I mean, now that I'm thinking about it, you mentioned it, like, oh my god, I feel like that is some, uh, uh a light years better idea to make Taskmaster the head of the Red Room. Uh, it, it's more compelling as a as a character. Like it, and I, it doesn't even have to be like a revenge thing. Like, oh, 
Natasha killed me. That's why I'm Taskmaster now. It doesn't even have to be like that. It it can just be like, oh shit, this is the business I'm in, and I want to fucking you know, I want to continue what my dad did. Wouldn't would that be more of a bond thing to say? Oh, I don't actually care about you. That didn't hurt me. You it, made, you yeah. just made me stronger. That would be yeah. a bond villain esque thing. And, uh, the fact that Natasha even, the fact that Anya or rather Ant- Antonia lives rent free in Natasha's head. Natasha yeah. thinks that oh my god, I fucking killed the girl and. How crazy would it be if, like, the girl's like, oh, I don't even think about you. I'm over. I'm over you fucking trying to kill me. She yeah. like she was an Avenger this entire time and wondered why Drakoff never. Like that's the thing. She was public figure. Drakoff never went after her because you know can't you know can't kill an Avenger. But it wasn't that. It was just literally she did not know who she was and she didn't care. Oh my god. It's like, ugh, whatever. This fucking movie. It's good, but. The stuff it, it, it misses on is kind of infuriating. It's it's the problem is is I think it has that midquel syndrome where it kind of has to fit into what followed and what was before. Um, I think the villains just they tried a bit too much. They had like all the the new red the Black Widows. They had Drakoff. They had Taskmaster. They just did too much and then threw in the family as well. Like, they should have cut one thing. Maybe cut Red Guardian from the script or something and have it just be her and her sister. And then focus on them taking down Drakoff. That's kind of the thing where I feel it is. Because they're trying to set something up while also telling a story in between two films. And it's just... It's not bad, you know? It's not a bad story. And I think they still can do a lot with Taskmaster. And I do think uh, that was... Like, even if it's not much, there was a little bit of character development about you know this character trying to break out of whatever control they were in like that it was natasha leading that character development it's an extrinsic one but yeah. i kind of think that she the technology should be used and introduce the real taskmaster at the end of the day or like there's an inspiration that taskmaster was a real person who shows up and is kind of pit but that would be like the mandarin twist at the same time <laughs> I, I think they're going to do more with taskmaster i just don't think it's going to be antonia moving forward yeah, I mean, it is a Taskmaster... Was it Program Protocol? I forgot what Protocol, was. yeah. A Taskmaster Protocol. So it's definitely not a one-and-done concept for sure. But I don't know. The Red Room got destroyed. Who knows where the the, the hard drive files for the Taskmaster Protocol is, right? Yeah. Who knows? It's it's an exciting uh, development, and I think that's kind of the interesting aspect of the this franchise that can always expand. You know... Uh, there ha- the film is still good. There's still some strong elements in it. The third, the last third, just kind of needed a bit more tightening up. But at the same time, I think expectations are just high after this long wait as well. So you know, we're expecting. We had Loki. We had Wanda- WandaVision breaking the mold. We've seen it kind of with Falcon and Winter Soldier as well. That that just didn't break through as much. It's it's going to be interesting. Um, but you know, we got a lot of stuff heading our way. It's going to be a busy uh h- half year. With three other films coming out and three other series, I think we're gonna be busy. <laughs> I mean, oh my god, the other films. I'm worried that I'm not gonna even be able to watch them because they're not on Disney Plus. Their theaters aren't open here, so fingers crossed that by the time Shang Chi releases, they, they decide to put it on Disney Plus too. Definitely, it's it's gonna be interesting uh, how everything develops and. Especially with Finn, Black Widow's box office is kind of keeping up with uh, pre-pandemic numbers. So it, it looks good for them right now. But if they don't, you know, if week two or week three just crash us down, we might go back to this this double, fee, you know, double release schedule with Disney yeah. Plus. And but, you know, only time will tell, sadly, at this point. Yeah, OK. Yeah, right, it's true. But. We have, we'll probably have a lot more news until then. We have the last, you know, next week is the finale of Loki. In August, we'll have What If and many, many other things are heading our way. So it's going to be exciting. Um, man, this is 59th episode already. So perfect time with Loki finale to be our 60th episode yeah. of the MCU Exchange podcast. Yeah. It, crazy. We got to get Aaron back on here. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. All right. With that, if you're anyone, you hope you guys enjoyed. Um, be sure to check out our other episodes. You can find us on pretty much any of your favorite podcast centers, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. We're excited for the next episode. We're excited for the future of the MCU. You can definitely 
Uh, also check out mcuexchange.com to be on top of the latest Marvel Cinematic Universe news. Uh, and if you want to follow us, you can follow Charles on... You can follow me on Twitter at CFS with Marvel. And you can follow me on at that Abel, T-H-A-T-A-B-E-R-L. Uh, and until next time. Bye.